For thousands of years we have gazed. For thousands of years we have gazed upon the same stars. Each of us believing that we are looking at something else, the border between heaven and the world, tiny glimpses of the future, or long gone souls, or like that matter that's held together by its own gravity. Some of the stars appeared to stay fixed, and some of them wandered around, and we named them after gods and stuff like Venus, Mars, Saturn. We are now only three planets. Oh, Jupiter. This is the evening star, which is the brightest star in the evening sky for some months. And this is the morning star, which is the brightest star in the morning sky for some months. The ancient Greeks called one of them Hesperus and the other one Phosphorus. And then, like Parmenid or Pythagoras, a historian doesn't tell me which one it was, made the realization that it's actually the same object. The morning star is the evening star. It's, it's one object, it's what we today call Venus. But wait a minute, you might say, holding Aristotle's on logics in one hand and like making an, an angry fist with the other one. You can't have so many names for the same object. This will generate confusion, and confusion is legal! And then you see me holding God of Freges on sense and reference in my hand and I throw it at you and you die. Frege's paper from 1892 addressed a very curious puzzle in philosophy of language. If you have two names for the same object, then according to the principle of identity, these two names should be interchangeable. It doesn't matter which name you use to describe an object. Which means that the morning star is the brightest object in the evening sky. Which, yeah, it's true. Now, let's look at these two sentences. The morning star is the morning star and the evening star is the morning star. Now, these two sentences are both true again, and they should mean the same, but do they? Everyone can know the first sentence to be true just by virtue of, you know, definitions. Of course, the morning star has to be the morning star. But to know the second sentence to be true, you have to make quite some astronomical observations. The sentences differ in what Frege called their cognitive value. And to see the significance of this value, let's look at these two sentences. The first ancient Greeks believed the morning star to be the brightest object in the mornings. No, not the object. What the brightest star in the morning sky or the ancient Greeks believed the evening star to be the brightest star in the morning sky. Now, as you might note, one of those sentences is actually wrong because of the change with it. Last time we talked about St. Augustine's theory of meaning according to which objects just refer individually to objects like evening star, Venus, but Frege introduces a second aspect to meaning, the way or what he calls sense in which an object is being described. We can describe Venus as the brightest sky, brightest star in the morning sky, or the brightest star in the evening sky, or as the second planet from sun. All of those sentences refer to the same object, so their meaning is the same in virtue of what object they refer to, but still, their meaning is different in the way they describe that same object. And now, which is important for all of you who watched my first video where we talked about the problems of making assertions such as God does not exist. Like if you say God does not exist, it seems like you're first stating there's like an object called God and then you ascribe the property of non-existence to that object but then you're like, wow, wait, what even is non-existence and how can something that does not exist have a property and wait, you're saying that nothing exists but you're still referring to something which doesn't exist so you're referring to nothing so your sentence is meaningless. That's where Frege introduces an idea which laid the foundations for early analytic philosophy, which stretches from Russell and Wittgenstein all the way to the Vienna Circle. The distinction between the messy and often misleading ordinary language, which he calls natural language, and the universal logical form of ideal language. Natural language is messy. We use the same word, for example, is, to describe variously different functions. 
Let's look at these sentences. Socrates is wise, a man, or real. It looks like all those sentences share the same structure, the subject predicate structure. We have the subject, Socrates, to which we ascribe different properties. But this appearance is misleading because they only share a grammatical structure, but their logical structure differs greatly. And we can see that once we translate those sentences into Frege's ideal language. Only the first sentence actually ascribes a property to Socrates, but the second one just states that Socrates is a group member of all the men. And the third one just says that there is a thing which we call Socrates. Frege wants us to be able to express our thoughts clearly, and he invites philosophers to drop the natural language and, you know, adopt his ideal language, translate the discourse into a rigid and systematic language that would get rid of all of this misleading and messy forms of expression that lead to various, you know, philosophical problems that yeah, are just, you know, apparent on the grammatical surface, but on the logical surface, like, they only appear on a grammatical level, but on a logical level, they just dissolve. This vagueness or messiness, according to Frege, could not be more apparent in sentences such as God does not exist. It might seem that we are having a subject-predicate structure, but once we logically analyze it, we translate it into an ideal universal logical form, then we see that none of that is actually stated. All that's stated is that there is no such individuum which would exist and we call God. Of course, this ideal language had to be yet constructed, and that's where philosophers like Russell and Wittgenstein and many others joined the effort. Russell wasn't completely satisfied with how Frege addressed the problems posed here, and he tweaked his philosophy of language a little, which led to solutions that were impressive enough to, s to start a whole new way of doing philosophy which we today call analytic philosophy. So in the next video, we will talk about Russell.